Hello, my brothers and sisters. This is Elder Joseph Stafford of the Man from Heaven Ministries, bringing you more Kingdom Principles. Today, we're going to talk about some things that uh, may be controversial, may be something that we don't look at as far as the name is concerned, but I want to share with you things that will help you, help me, grow in the things that God will have us to grow into. The scripture tells us to say, and all that get and get understanding. So we're going to talk about some things that um, we hear. We want to get a full understanding on these things so we know how to plan correctly in our lives to become what God will have us to be. So let's pray. Father God, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. We thank you, Father, for being with us this day, cause us to see here the things you will have us to see and hear. I ask you to bless those that under the sound of my voice, allow the follow ground for those that are hard of hearing, that they hear the word of God. Let their understanding be enlightened by this word of God. We give you praise for now, my Father. Thank you, that, thank you now for doing that for us and working with us. In the name of Yeshua, again, I pray. Amen. Um, today, I'm going to talk about sin, transgressions, and idols. These things can be quite um, controversial as to how we actually see it because we have heard a lot about it, but we haven't really heard the definition of or how it really applies. But we don't want to be in a position to where we're being lackadaisical about what sin actually means and how it applies. Example, when a young person does a wrong toward me sometime, I've seen and heard it many times, they say, oh, my bad, they go to the next step. To me, that seems insincere. It seems as though um, they didn't care or they didn't take into consideration what was done or did not take the actions to learn how to avoid that in the future. That's just to me. We don't want to be in a position where we're doing that before God when we say sin, transgression, even dealing with idols. We don't want to say that, oh, I just, I sin, well, so much, so for that, I'm going to the next step. We need to look at it closely and carefully. We want to be honest before ourselves. We want to say the things God wants us to say, do the things God wants us to do. I put together a simple statement before I began to speak about why this is important to us. The rationale of looking into this topic is the ability, to, ability of the created to create things to justify oneself in the wrong he or she wants to do or feel like and feel like it's okay. To be real before God, the first thing is to be honest with yourself and before God. So this honesty is very, very important because even from the beginning, we talked about how that once you're saved, you're saved from the penalty of sin to eternal life. But we know we had to work out on soul salvation with fear and trembling. So we go through the process of taking away the authority of the Adamic nature, take away the influences of the satanic push through spirits by studying, fasting, and praying. Studying, fasting, and praying to get rid of these things in our lives that are contrary to God's will. But in doing that, we also learn the heart of God so that we'll understand what God's rationales are as to why he said these things are wrong. Once we have done our studying, and remember the letter kill us, spirit make the life, spirit make the life. So as we study the word, and the spirit of God is enhanced with that word, gives us a greater revelation or an understanding of why these things are wrong. And then, when, then, we, then within ourselves, we would not want to find ourselves doing wrong. We would not want to find ourselves doing things contrary to God's will because what makes sense is doing God's will because the result is life eternal on, on every level. On the earth, that means you'll be able to be free in your mind and your heart with things that would have once bound you. You're free in your mind to think clearly, not be inhibited by spiritual implications that will come into you to make you think things contrary to God's will. Like the scripture says about spiritual warfare, cast down imagination. And every high thing is all itself against the knowledge of God, bringing the captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We have to also have a ready to revenge all disobedience, 
when our obedience is fulfilled. So that being said, we look at going forth in things that God has for us by being aware of what it is that's hindered us. Now, this, this doing this helps us be able to help others who are going through processes, who are going through changes to be delivered from their issues. Let's begin with sin. We got definitions in Hebrew and Greek about what sin is and some scriptures to go along with as with emphasize certain thoughts. So let's go with one of the first definitions I have for sin in Hebrew is called chata. And all it says is sin or a sinful thing. It's not, that, it's not defining what sin is. I know in our hearts we know what sin is, but we want to define it so we have something to grab hold to. Grab hold of that picture and say, ah, this is what it is. I can't do that no more because this is the result of that action. You know, the um, the laws they say was, um, scientific law said for every action is opposite equal reaction. Well, that's not necessarily a scientific scenario. That's a God scenario. Because if you do good, good comes to you. You do evil, evil comes to you. God repays you for like things. So it's not necessarily opposite, opposite. You can't do even get good. So that's, that's the key right there. So going to the Greek, there's two definitions I'm going to share with you in Greek. One's called harmatha, which means a sin or failure. The other word is called hamatano, hamatano, which means to miss the mark, do wrong, aka sin. So what is that? What is this that we're doing that is so sinful before God that's wrong? Everything that's not like him. He made us in his image and likeness. Even though we took the fall with our grandfather Adam. And we still suffer the consequences of that fall. We have to recognize that fall and begin to say, okay, I can overcome this. In the Old Testament, there was a man named Enoch. Enoch was a man living in a day and a time there was no written script that we know of. But he found a light in the eyes of God. He began to be a friend of God. Even, even so much that when his friendship with God was so great, he was able to walk off the earth without saved physical death. So if in that day there was an awareness, we also had the same day in this day as well, an awareness. Because Jesus promised us in that day, those that were dead in Christ should rise first. And that they be living, be called on air with him. We're working toward that day. In order to get to that day, he also says something in St. Luke 18. In that day, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Remember, faith is not foolishness. Faith is based upon foundational principles, it's based upon belief, understanding, and knowledge. All those things work together to cause and prove the word and the will of God. Saying all that to say this is that when we look at sin and we walk against God and we do things we know that are not right before God, and yet we do it and say, well, I can't help it because I'm only human. That's not a good enough excuse. Because scripture says all have sinned with ED means past tense and come short of the glory of God. What brings us to a point of sinlessness or righteousness is by accepting the full counsel of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we've done that, then we have the ability to fight away the earthly inclinations or the Adamic nature. We have the ability to push away the thoughts, the vain ideas that come our way of spiritual implications to make us do things that are not convenient. Let's go into um, 1 Kings 16, 19, and 20 to give you an idea of what I'm trying to bring forth today. Because of the sins he committed, speaking of Zimri, doing evil in the sight of the, of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam. And because of his sin, he caused Israel 
to sin. Remember, you're, influ you're influential. You may not think that you have that much pull on anybody's life, but people are looking at you all the time. They say that person is righteous. They're good people. Now, you know, they're doing this over here. Don't look right, but if they do it, I'm sure it's okay with God. I can do it too. And that's what Israel set in motion with, to follow behind their king, who is in error. The only king we need to follow behind is God the Father, through Jesus Christ, his son, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's all we need to follow behind, because then we find ourselves not in a point of error. Not in a point of things that can cause controversial scenarios in our life to cause us to fall. Okay? And a fall before God can be eternal if we don't redeem ourselves through repentance quickly. That don't mean sin and go back and do it again. Because when you repent, it does not mean repeat. You turn 180 degrees away from the thing you did before with sorrow, <clears throat> with heartfelt regret, and promise of banning yourself from that thing that once bound you. For many of us in prisons now, because of our mind, because of our situation, because of things that we have believed, saying, oh, I cannot do it. There's no hope for me. But God has hope for you. The hope is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, to be that point of contact for you through the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. So we don't have to walk in the ways of sin. And I know some of you say, well, I don't know when I sin. Well, if you study the word more and see what God has said concerning things that are contrary to his will, you get a better perspective on what is sin, what's not sin. You also get the idea of knowing that it makes sense because you want to buy into what he's saying to you about why this is wrong. The end result of this matter is this because of that. We have to be in a position to understand that we are more than conquerors because the one who preceded us has conquered. But that doesn't, doesn't mean we, we have to sit there and lay in, uh, 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 in ease, just lay back like nothing's going on. We have to be in a readiness to revenge. Like I shared with you before, it casts down imagination and how have things all self against the knowledge of God, bring the captivity every thought to the beings of Christ. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience once your obedience is fulfilled. That, that, that readiness is that you have the full counsel of God in you. You have that word in you. You have fast and pray. You're going to deal with death and higher heights in him to the point where there's no way that you would allow the enemy to come in or to come by way of demonic precipice, coming by demonic nature. Not even by pharmaceutical, which is called sorcery. All these things you will have the readiness to revenge because you will know the difference because of the study, because of the prayers, because of the fastings. Because when you fast, you learn how to pray even more so because you're praying through the whole process to maintain yourself through the fast. And also the same aspect, you learn to hear from God as you study his word and put them together because the Holy Spirit's right there with you, stirring up that gift in you. So let's go a little further. In St. Mark 2, 5 through 12, this is how it reads. Amplified version again. When Jesus saw their active faith springing from confidence in him, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there debating in their hearts the implication of what he had said. Why does this man talk that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins, remove guilt, notify sins, penalty, and assign righteousness except God alone? Immediately, Jesus being fully aware of their hostility and knowing in his spirit that they were thinking this, said to them, why are you debating? and arguing about these things in your hearts. Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on and power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your mat, and go home. 
And he got up and immediately picked up the mat and went out before them all. So they all were astonished and glorified and praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I bring that to you because if we are images of God and we have the example of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, to show forth the life force that we ourselves have, he would not have put in the prayer or the model prayer we call the Lord's Prayer, Lord's Prayer, forgive us our transgressions as we forgive those who trespass against us. So that puts in our authority as we pray to God to forgive us as we, as we forgive others, that we have the ability to forgive others for things that have happened to us directly. And then in the same vein, to lead somebody to God, to ask God to forgive them for their trespasses. So we share the ability of Yeshua to forgive sins on the earth, the power to forgive sins on the earth. Now I say that to say this, is that this man being paralyzed was not constitutionally based upon sin. It could have been as he spoke to another person about healing their child. And the disciples said, who sinned? The mother or the father? The child came out this way. And he said, nobody sinned. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. He said, nobody sinned. It's for the glory of God that this person be healed, delivered and set free. So with that being said, there are certain things that do come because of sin that causes illness in our body. I use the word gluttony as a key word because sometimes when we do too much of the same thing over and over again and expect ourselves not to be affected by it, we have the greater effect. And we have all these things in our body that we don't need to have in our body. And it causes us to have things that we suffer through. We have to find ways to get around it to get better. But that's because we have self-inflicted ourselves. We've wounded ourselves by gluttony. Everything that tastes good, they know it's good. Not in such a large quantity. Okay? That goes the same aspect about pharmaceutical or drugs. It's taking outside its parameter what it needs to be used for. See, the word pharmaceutical is a Greek word which means sorcery. Okay? Sorcery is based upon things being ingested, as witchcraft is based upon things that are brought to you mentally by spiritual entities or impressions that are brought forth by others as they push their will out into the atmosphere. With this knowledge, we have the ability in God through fasting and prayer and understanding his word and his will to wish, push these things away from us, to cause them not to be part of our scenario. We have to be positioned in God to receive the full counsel of God. And again, it's not an easy course. When you fast and pray, it's not comfortable. When we fast and pray, we are looking for avenues to get deeper into the knowledge of God, that's understanding, deeper in understanding how we fit into the puzzle and then how we then can do the things God would have us to do. Remember, the letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. So we have to be positioned again to understand what the word of God says and allowing the Holy Spirit to uh, um, put more power to that word to become a reality to us and then, then it can come reality to someone else as we show forth the faith of God in the things that we do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's go into our next part of our topic, which is called transgression. Transgression is still sin, but it's the way that it's done that makes it appear a little different, but yet the results are very, very similar. I'm going to use um, four translations this time for. Uh, transgression to a Hebrew and it's going to set us at a point where we understand where this, where this is coming from. This, this sin comes with an attitude. I know better, but I'm going to do what I want to do because I want to do it. That's the attitude that's coming forth in that, okay? The first definition of, of transgression is pisha, which means transgression. Obviously enough, as Hebrew means transgression, but the word akin to that is called pasha. It means to rebel, 
transgress. Now we're going in the right direction because when you know the laws of God or the spirit of God and you know what he wants us to do and you rebel against his law, you then transgress. And it is called sin. Same neighborhood, just a different name, but a different implication because on a stronger level. In Greek, the word is called parabasis. It's called a going aside, a transgression. And the next word is called patatoma. Paratoma, excuse me, paratoma. It means a false step, a transgress, or to a trespass. It's, a, it's called unconscious or non-deliberate. Now, the only time when somebody transgress against you, against God, and they're not aware, they're unconscious, it's not deliberate because they have not studied. They have not taken into consideration the situation or the people or the person they're dealing with, and much less they haven't taken into consideration God in this matter. So when you don't consider the effect of this move you're making, even though, and I'm going to say it this way, your spirit is jumping inside saying, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right. I can't tell you why, but it's not right. You feel it, you sense it, but you push against it. You push against it and do it until you see the end result. And if you have any heart at all past the transgression, you'll say, oh, God, forgive me. I didn't know what I was doing. I was in error. God, please help me correct this matter. That's a song of repentance, sung many times. Some people did not repent fully. They did a half turn or a quarter turn, excuse me. Instead of going 180 degrees, they went 60 degrees and turned back to do the same thing again, not taking into account that that change is necessary. When one repents, they go 180 degrees away from the thing that caused error. And by doing that, they do it with tears, fear, trembling, all the things that emotionally let the person knows as well as God knows that you sincerely do not want to do that no more. You understand the causes of sin. You understand the ramifications of the error. And because of that, you then turn to him and say, not my will, Father, but thy will be done. Show me your precepts. Teach me your ways. Show me the way I can be the better me in you. All that's a growth process. We have to be in that position so we know that this is what God wants from us. Not to repeat the error. Let's go into numbers. I'm going to share with you some of the rationale as to why this is important. This is also the transgressions. This is um, numbers 14, 41 through 44. It reads this way and five version. But Moses said, why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when it comes? When, you, when it will not succeed. Why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord when it will not succeed? That's the key right there. Moses knew they knew about what was being done, but they wanted to pursue, as you will hear as the scriptures read further. Do not go up, or you will be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be in front of you and you will fall by the sword because you have turned away from following the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. Listen to this. But in their arrogance, they dared to go up to the ridge of the hill country. However, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in the country came down and struck the Israelites and scared them as far as Homa. Obedience is better than sacrifice. That's on two levels. One level is that why do wrong when you know the end result is evil? You're not sacrificing evil because you think you can get by with it. If you do good before the Lord, that sacrifice of what end result comes because of your disobedience won't be there. If you look at how Moses told him very simply, God's not with you. 
You're disobeying God. You, you chose not to follow him. You thought you found a way around it because you were in the family. Okay? By the family of Israel, they thought because I got Israel's name. I'm in the family. I can do what I want to do. I don't have to obey God's law. I'm going to do what I want to do and continue to move on because I'm protected because I'm one of God's children. That's not so. Israelites suffered a great defeat. And was chased away as far as Horma or Egypt. They found themselves in error. And they suffered the consequences of by not obeying what God had told them to do. And at that time, Moses was the man of God who spoke very clearly God's word. As if an angel came and spoke, as if God himself came and spoke. He spoke God's word so that they would understand that Going this path was not beneficial. But they chose to disobey and follow their own ideas and precepts and found themselves being scattered by the two nations that they came up against. So we can't be cocky, can't be high-minded. We can't walk in the aspect of being a rebel so we transgress the laws of God. We can't be in that position to where we... Um, we find ourselves not doing God's will in fullness. I'm going to go to, with, uh, go to you in uh, to Mark 11, uh, 25 and 26. This is the Amplified Version again. And this, this goes back to what we talked about for us, um, even the Lord's Prayer. Uh, verse 25 says, when you stand praying, you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Drop the issue. Let it go. So that your Father in heaven will also give you your transgressions and your wrongdoings against him and others. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your transgressions. So, like I said earlier, since we emulate Jesus, we have the same authority that he has to forgive the earth. So we also must be able to forgive each other, knowing that this is because of error, because of ignorance, because of like Jesus said, when they put them on, on the cross, forgive them, Father, so they know not what they do. They did it in ignorance, not knowing the full counsel, not understanding the prophecy, not understanding things moving forward. But it had to be for Jesus to die on our behalf to make us who we are today, to fulfill what God said, even to Eve, when he said, unto man shall be born from you, a man child shall be born of you, that will deliver your people and the implications of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, all that is let us know that we are more than what people say we are. But in knowing that, we can't flaunt it in their face. We can't go against the humbleness and meekness that God wants us to walk in, to be high-minded, to be um, full of ourselves, so many words. We want to make sure that we are doing what God will help us to do in full knowledge of what God wants us to do, knowing his precepts, no one's understanding, buying into where it makes sense, because if it makes sense, you're willing to do it because it does make sense, versus I'm doing it because God told me to do it. I'm doing it now because God told me to do it because it has effect in my life. In other words, this was, this word I'm, I'm getting from God is going to teach me how not to do the wrong thing, but then how to do the right thing in such a way that I'm delivered, first and foremost, and then I've been, been able to be an uh, avenue for us to be delivered as well. I must first be saved that, that I can then first save. Also, in an aspect of being delivered, saved, gifted, all these things that God has given us to put in us, it doesn't limit us to just being um, um, that and that alone. We don't want to find ourselves positioned in such a way that we're... Um, Becoming arrogant, thinking that we don't need this thing anymore. We must stay in the same position of humbleness and meekness before God. And remember, remembering our first steps, we never get too old to fast, to pray, see God's face in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We are never too old for that, or never too young to start. We got to be positioned in God. That's the key because every person is not the same, but there's a, a calling on everybody's life to do a certain thing. 
So in order for us to do that certain thing, we have to be understanding of the gifts God placed within us that we can walk with in the avenue that God wants us to walk in. Some people are gifted in handiwork. They can build things, put things together. All that wonderful stuff is beautiful and can show forth God's glory in all that which they do. Because if they do no more than show forth their handiwork and tell them that God loves them, show them God's love through their actions, blessing them, that gives them an avenue for somebody in the body of Christ or God himself to intervene to bring deliverance to that particular person. But no matter what you go through, you still have to be positioned to where you are saying, I'm not enough by myself. I need the word of God, Jesus Christ. The word of God, the Father. Word of God, the Holy Ghost. I need this so strong, I'm going to fast, deny myself so that I cry out to receive more of him. I cry out more so in the presence of the Holy Spirit. In him will this word become relevant and more powerful in my life so that I'm not found in my transgressions. And I'm able to be an avenue to bring others out of their transgressions and their missteps so they become the better that God will have them to be. We can't do again like uh, again, I can say it from the beginning when somebody did me wrong and they turn around, oh, my bad, and go on as though it's nothing without making recompense for what they said. We have to be in a position where we say, God, I recognize my faults. I recognize my error. I'm asking you, Father, help me get delivered from this. Show me your ways. Teach me your statutes that it makes common sense to me. That your supernatural becomes natural with me. The word super means more natural. So don't, don't get confused when I say supernatural. Super means more. I want your supernatural, God. You're more natural because it's more natural for me to follow you than to follow things of the world and the implications of things who want to do me, or people who want to do me harm. Let's go into our last topic here, which is idols. I have, I think, four definitions again here, a couple in Hebrew, a couple in Greek, about idols. This, this can become complicated to some and the others make sense. So we're going to talk about it in such a way, hopefully, that it will make sense to you. The word idol in Hebrew, the first word I have is called peseta. peseta. It only means idol, okay? So there I am with the word that means idol. But let's go to another word that... Um, Talks about idols that were done in the Old Testament, how they looked at them, because they didn't they did differentiate between idols and images or whatever. They were all considered idols. So the other word is called teraphim. Teraphim, a kind of idol, perhaps a household idol. Okay. So that's not saying a whole lot, but it's probably a statuette or something that's in a house that's in there. I'm not saying it's even I'm saying it's good, but we're gonna go a little further and talk about more of that. Let's go to the Greek. <clears throat> in the word, in the word, the Greek, the word for idol or sacrifice to idols, this is what we're going to talk about. It's called, uh, and I'm, I'm going to try to pronounce the word. It's too, too much for me on this. I'm not much from Greek <laughs> pronunciations in this day and time. I'm, I'm going to learn, though. Um, but the meaning of that word means basically idols that are being sacrificed to. Idols that are being sacrificed to. And the last one is called image. It's called Eladon, Greek word again, an image for worship, by implication, a false god. So let's go to Exodus 20, 1 through 8. And we're going to talk about idols, what they mean, how they came to be. What, what, what are you talking about idols? Why is this so important? Well, Exodus 21 through 8 in the King James Version says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's the key word right there. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So we look at idols, images, pictures, all these things. We got to put a balance to it so we can look at what is really being said here. 
because the image of the, the definitely gave you earlier was about worshiping an idol, anything that's contrary to the will of God. So let's go a little bit further. And thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. And showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him countless or guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, let's let's go this real, through this real quick. The rationales behind images, idols, anything that's made in the heavens, image of heavens on, on, on the earth or under the earth, is because he don't want his people to be sidetracked to worship those things. Sometimes we count them as luck. Luck is not a real deal. Luck is just happenstance, like happiness. Happiness is happenstance. You can be happy or you've been happy. Wishing is just wishing on nothing because you you're, you're hoping against hope. You're wishing, you're wishing, wishing for something to take place and it's not going to happen. When it does, you then you can count it as, well, I'm lucky. Now realize there's certain things that have to take place. Now, when we have images in our lives that we look to as being greater in our respect toward God, that's when we fall. If I have a beautiful, clean, good looking, good running automobile and I keep it nice and clean, I keep it clean all the time, I make sure it's shining and polished, make sure nothing happens to it, get offended when somebody touches it or do something wrong, I'm worshiping the vehicle. You get it? I'm worshiping that vehicle because I'm putting it above anything and everything around about it. I'm putting myself in a position to where I'm saying, can't do better than me. This is my thing. It becomes a point of worship. Not to the type that you would say, oh, I worship you, you give me, you give me that. It, it comes forth in the attitude of how you treat a thing. If you treat a thing so great that is greater than your relationship with God, that becomes an idol to you. I'm not too much on the idea of the images and things that, that God spoke about here because he knew his people at that time. He knew that they would take these things, the images, and build things to worship. Much like when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they talk about how God came through like a raging bull. He came through, made the river uh, a highway for them to walk through. He caused the Egyptians who followed him to die. They took the gold and built an altar, built a golden calf to worship it, to reference what God had done. And that's the thing God wants, to, wants us not to do is to build anything or to be caught up in anything that would bring us to a point where we separate ourselves from the love of God and not looking at him as being the first and the only avenue of deliverance, of, of being set free, of being everything that he can be in us. He doesn't want that from us. Um, let's go into... One, two more scriptures, and I'm going to shut down after this. I'm a little long today, I know, but I have to get this in, have to get this in, because it was important for me to get it to you last week, but I wasn't able to due to circumstance beyond my control, but I'm here today. So make sure you get this information about sin, transgression, and idols. Seek ye first kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things should be added unto you. That's the key. All things spiritual, first and foremost, in front of spirit, propels physical things. So that's the balance. There got to be a balance in this thing. Psalms 121, 1 through 6. This is one scripture that um, I have tendency of um, saying a little differently than others. This is the King James Version. It says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. 
He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He will not. He will keepeth the. Uh, he will keepeth thee. He will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The Lord, the sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from his from this time forth, even forevermore. Now, the reason I emphasize using the scripture here today is because it's something that I've heard for years and I learned by reading it. It made more sense to me as I read it because I understood what was happening in the days of what we call the Old Testament. It says, I will lift up my eyes into the hills. Why? What's on the hills? In that day on the hills, there were totem poles, there were idols, all these things that they worshipped other than God. They put them on a hill to say they were high and lifted up. They did that because they wanted to emphasize that their God was powerful. So in reference, that statement should have been a question. I lift up my eyes on the hills. Question number two. Whence cometh my help? Question mark. Verse two answers the question. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And that's, thus we have the understanding that when we recognize the enemy, we recognize the idols that are set before us, that are high and lifted up, they're set up on hills, they're sometimes our movie stars, sometimes they're our sports figures, sometimes they're automobiles, sometimes they're our homes, sometimes they're our uh, uh, significant others. These things must not precede or be exalted above the Lord. I will lift up my eyes under the hills. What's coming to my help? My help coming from the Lord. And that's what we need to know. That's we need, where we need to be. So I'm not coming against anybody who has things in their home that they count as treasures, as long as it's not counted as being greater than your relationship with God. I say that because if we find ourselves as children of Israel who walked in a level of ignorance, who chose not to know, Keyword, they chose not to know, but follow after the king, the priest, whoever was in charge. We're different in this day and time. We have had the example of Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, to lead us, to direct us, to guide us, to know that there's no name given unto heaven whereby men shall be saved except by the name of Jesus Christ. And this salvation comes not by the name alone, but by every act that proceeds from the person that carried that name. And I'm going to go back to his original name, which was Yeshua. His name means God is our salvation. So once we have come to that point of understanding, and we know this to be a very, very powerful truth, we will not be in position to make ourselves um, afraid of anything that even throws our way because we have not girded ourselves up with the power of God, through his word, by his spirit, by our humbling ourselves before him, being meek enough to obey his will moving forward. Because the whole aspect of this walk with God all of a sudden makes sense. It makes sense for us to walk with him, not to walk against him. Because there are certain laws that are put in place. Even God himself will not break his own law. So that says a lot within itself. So for today, my friends, I bid you adieu. I pray that God opens your heart and mind to receive this word and work with it with a change that is needful for your life. I'm going to be talking more in the near future about you and God, the example that Jesus left for us and how we fit in. God bless you. God love you. I pray that all things that he does for you is yes and amen.